All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. We are so excited and happy to see you all here today, whether you're joining us live here on our webinar or you're joining us for the replay. We are so delighted and welcome you to our Green Wheels webinar series. Our webinar series is running today from um, September 28th all the way all the way through the week till October 2nd and this webinar series is hosted by Sustainable Fairfield. Sustainable Fairfield was um, originated in about 2004 and it came about through a resolution of our RTM and they had they passed a resolution for clean energy and then um, um, Bob Wall and Larry Cayley spearheaded Sustainable Fairfield with the help of Jim Modavalli. And those three members are still with us today on our board and um, they're active and um, amazing um, members of, of the task force. So originally the task force was actually called the Clean Energy Task Force. But last year we changed the name to Sustainable Fairfield to reflect you know, a, a broader um, array of the sustainability issues that our that our task force is really involved with. So we're involved with with so many so many um, sustainability issues. We actually have a sustainability plan that you can look at, and it's on our website, sustainablefairfield.org. So it's um, there's 15 members on our task force, and it's um, just amazing. Usually this time of year, we have um, our Green Wheels Expo, and um, it's, a, it's in support of National Drive Electric Week. And um, last year, we actually had an electric school bus from White Plains School District. It was a lined electric school bus, and it came to our Green Wheels Expo, and hundreds of people got on that bus. And it was one of the, one of the, one of the things that was really catalyzed the excitement around electric school buses, I believe, throughout the state. So this year, what we're doing as part of our virtual webinar series is we actually have a virtual site visit this Friday at White Plains with, the, with their electric school bus. So for all of those of you who are interested in electric school buses, we invite you to come back on Friday for our virtual site visit of the, of the um, electric school bus there in White Plains. So, um, so we're just so excited to have all of you here with us today. We would like to thank our sustainable um, Fairfield Green Wheels Expo webinar partners and sponsors, which are Maritime Chevy, William Levy Architects, Techno, the Electric Vehicle Club of Connecticut, Mo Green, Sustain, Pure, Greater New Haven Clean Cities Coalition, Southwestern Connecticut Clean Cities Coalition, and Live Green. So we are so delighted to have our guests here with us today. We've got Tracy Babbage from Connecticut Deep. We have Tony Chirolis, who will be representing uh, the Cheaper program. And we have Josh Kirstenbaum from Maritime Chevy. So what we really want to talk about today is there's this huge goal that we have um, of 125,000 EVs in Connecticut by 2025, so in four years. and. Um, you know that's a that's a that's a lot of, that's a lot of vehicles to be getting in. So how are we going to do it? So we you know we need a plan. We need to know why we need to do it. We need a plan, and uh, and I know that together we can all get there. As as part of our as part of our um, sustainable Fairfield um, Green Wheels Expo event this week, um, I just want want to go back a little bit. We started this week um, our our um, our event with an interview with Jay Leno, who is a huge car buff, and that was on Saturday. And um, you can watch that interview on our website. And, and it was it was um, done by Jim Modavalli. So thank you, Jim, for that amazing interview with Jay Leno. And then yesterday, we actually had a EV car parade and it went from Westport to Fairfield and it was kicked off by our the first selectman of Westport Jim Murphy and we went all the way through Fairfield and uh, all the way from Westport into Fairfield and um, and then we we ended there at, at, at Town Hall and it was um, welcomed by Nancy Lefkowitz uh, for select uh, our one of our first select women at um, the town of Fairfield and so it was an amazing event and and one of the um, really noteworthy parts of the um, of the parade was it was led by an electric vehicle and not just any electric vehicle, but it was led by Westport's electric police car. 
So wow, how exciting is that, that Westport has an electric police car. And um, the other thing that's, that's very noteworthy about Westport is that it was announced at the, at the parade yesterday that Westport has 500 EVs registered to the town of Westport. I believe that's the most EVs in any, any municipality in the state. So that's an impressive number. Now, if we look at the 125,000 vehicles that we need in our, in our state by 2025, and you look at the goals by town, by, by population, Westport School is 999. So Westport is actually just a little, little um, halfway there to their goal. So hats off to Westport, they're halfway to the goal. So it's just amazing work that they have done, done there. Um, and just kind of to add on to that, I will, I will mention that um, Fairfield, I believe, leads the state in charging infrastructure. And we have 22 locations um, within our town that, um, where people can charge their EVs. There is um, a website, um, afdc.energy.gov, slash charging stations. And you can look at that site and you can see charging stations in your town, in the region, in the state, and across the country. So that's a great resource to find out about charging stations. So today we really want to talk about, you know, why, why do we need these electric vehicles? How can we afford them? How can we purchase them? And, um, and, and how are the dealers supporting this? And how can the dealers really help help us reach our goals. So it's just an honor to, um, to start off and to introduce Tracy Babich, who is Bureau Chief Air Management of Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. Tracy, thank you so much for joining us today. Sure, uh, Daphne, thank you so much for having me. Uh, can everyone see my screen? We good? Yes. Okay, great. So thank you so much. I want to, you know, uh, give a big shout out to Sustainable Fairfield and uh, Clean Cities and, and Daphne, thank you so much for putting this together and uh, including us as, as part of this effort. I really appreciate it. And I think you guys are doing such great work and getting the message out and making this information available for those that can't join us today is just uh, fantastic. So I'm gonna start with the why, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, air quality and really focus in on Connecticut. Um, we have some pretty significant air quality problems, and uh, this will give you some background and uh, some understanding about why uh, deploying zero emission vehicles is so critical, uh, such a critical component to Connecticut's overall strategy to achieve clean air and address climate change. Um, we really suffer from a, uh, a significant ozone uh, problem. We are uh, non-attainment for ozone here in Connecticut. This just gives you a map statewide of Connecticut. Uh, and uh, basically the entire state is designated uh, as non-attainment for both the 2008 and 2015 um, ozone standards. So, uh, we, we've struggled with clean air. This, even this year uh, during the pandemic, when we've seen uh, reduced transportation uh, miles, you know, folks are teleworking, we still have had 17 days where we've exceeded the national ambient air quality standards for ozone. Um, and that's, you know, matters a lot because uh, of those days are unhealthy um, and can be unhealthy for particularly for individuals that suffer from respiratory diseases. So this is really uh, something that, you know, uh, we really have uh, had a, a suite of strategies to try and address and we continue to work on it because it's so important. I want to uh, just give you a little breakdown because when we talk about ozone, we're really, one of the key things that we're doing is we're addressing the precursors of ozone. So we talk a lot about um, uh, precursors, which uh, for ozone include um, oxides of nitrogen and volatile organic compounds, because it's those two compounds in the presence of sunlight that create smog. So when I start to talk a little bit about our strategies, including what we're doing with passenger vehicles, we are really targeting those pollutants when we're talking about trying to address our air quality and public health challenges um, around these types of emissions. 
Um, this, this is just a quick snapshot of all the strategies that we've been implementing here in Connecticut over time. And so there have been a lot of them. But what's important is this slide basically shows you our trend uh, with respect to meeting the ozone standard, which goes, we uh, go back to 1975 in this slide. But you can see over time, we've implemented a lot of strategies and the reductions are coming down. So this is one of the ways that at Connecticut Deep, we can evaluate our progress and how we're doing as we implement a, a full suite of strategies to try and address our ozone problem here in Connecticut. And you know, one of the things I always like to remind folks is that air pollution does not represent uh, state boundaries. So we are working on uh, many of these strategies regionally and, and uh, you know, with partners across the country as well. So um, one of the things too, just as we talk a, a little bit about precursors, when we talk about um, nitrogen oxides, we've done so much to address what we refer to as stationary source uh, sources um, of, of NOx, that's our shorthand version. Um, so things like power plants um, and factories, industrial operations, we've really controlled emissions. What we're seeing is that the, what we refer to as the mobile source component are really the largest component of our NOx emissions, almost 67% here in the state. So that's also a big component of why, that, why we're really looking at um, reductions from passenger vehicles and other transportation related sources. So let's talk a, a little bit about what we've been doing here in Connecticut to address these emissions from passenger vehicles. So as Daphne said right at the beginning, um, we've adopted the California program, the California Low Emission Vehicle Program, including the Zero Emission Vehicle Program, which also has components to reduce greenhouse gases. So one important thing I will note with the California uh, program and the emission standards, it's an approach that uh, addresses multiple pollutants at once. So that's really important as well. It has the ability to reduce the full suite of emissions from motor vehicles, which is really important reason why we've done that. Um, we like to act regionally. We recently, uh, at, towards the end of July, signed on to a multi-state um, MOU to advance the medium duty and heavy duty sectors. Um, with 10 other, uh, I'm sorry, with uh, 13 other states and the District of Columbia to partner to increase the deployment of the medium and heavy duty uh, vehicles. So just, uh, you know, one of the points I want to get across is we really need to look at the full suite of the ability to reduce emissions. So it's on the passenger side, it's also on the, on the medium duty and heavy duty side, and we also are, fo are focused on um, off-road equipment and construction equipment. Um, as part of our full suite of strategies that we implement in Connecticut, we have, um, and, and almost everybody's probably familiar with our vehicle inspection and maintenance program that we, uh, the Department of Motor Vehicles administers. I, I always like to remind folks, you know, the emission standards are, you know, going after really stringent uh, emission standards is in a really important component, but we do need to make sure that those standards um, are, made, are achievable are, and uh, that our vehicles are maintained to achieve those standards. Otherwise, it's, it can be the equivalent of a, a heavily polluted vehicle if they're not maintaining those standards. We also have a very comprehensive EV roadmap that we released that really uh, lays out you know, how we can look at increased deployment. There's a lot in there that uh, is designed to assist us to achieve this very aggressive deployment uh, goal that Daphne mentioned at the, at the beginning as well. And then another important component, and Tony's going to talk a little bit more about our cheaper program. So to assist um, with the deployment of electric vehicles, having a consumer facing incentive is really important. And also, um, I want to underscore the importance of our dealers and Josh will provide a perspective on that. We really need um, you know, to work closely with our dealers and they have been a terrific and really important component to the success of the Cheaper program, which we'll talk about in a minute as well. Um, so how are we doing in EV sales? Where are we and where do we need to go? So I just gave you a quick, here's a quick snapshot of the rankings by state. California is leading the pack. 
Um, and they're, you know, just shy of 5%. We're a little over 1%. So we definitely have a ways to go. Um, and, you know, we, we do have these aggressive goals. So I, you know, it, it really becomes what are our key levers? What are our key tools to, to try and achieve the goals that we've set out? And I'm going to talk about two of them. I'm going to start out by talking about, um, you know, through the multi-state heavy duty ZEV MOU, uh, you know, when the states got together and decided to act regionally to increase the deployment of zero emission vehicles, uh, there, there was a, a plan that we worked on collectively, and there are a number of things that we recognized uh, would be uh, challenges that we would need to overcome. And two that I just, you know, for today's discussion wanted to highlight is consumer education and outreach. And we'll talk about the importance of incentives and for us through our cheaper program. But consumer education and outreach, um, I, you know, we believe is really, you know, one of the keys to unlocking, um, you know, increased deployment and, uh, you know, customer acceptance of this type of technology. So uh, one of the things uh, that uh, we identified in terms of, you know, the need to increase uh, customer awareness. Um, we need to make sure that we were, ex you know, are explaining to consumers the need to meet the state's air quality and climate goals and how an individual, you know, consumer's choices um, are important uh, as part of that and changing behavior and the choices of individual consumers and how that can really help us achieve our goals. Um, and then I think, you know, the other part is, thinking about this as part of your lifestyle and, you know, not only um, the environmental benefits that uh, can be yielded through making a, a choice to go to a zero emission vehicle, but it's also a lifestyle choice. So some of the things that I'm going to talk about with the consumer education and awareness uh, campaign that's been uh, deployed regionally, that's one of the angles I think, you know, we've really tried to emphasize. And then the other part is addressing the misinformation that, it, you know, is out there or overcoming, um, the, you know, some of what uh, is the, sort of the myths around, um, you know, uh, some of the specifics around, especially electric vehicles that uh, can impact deployment. So those are some of the things that we've tried to focus on uh, by aligning a regional uh, consumer uh, awareness campaign to really begin to address some of these things. And we really think it's imperative that we're aligning our education and outreach um, with a uh, rollout of electric vehicles. So um, this regional uh, consumer education awareness campaign uh, is called Drive Change, Drive Electric. So it's been a collaborative effort for all the states that are involved and signatories to the zero emission vehicle MOU. Um, that is uh, the, the genesis of our commitment. So we've been working together on this campaign and it's, it involves the states as well as the um, auto manufacturers have been a, a critical partner. Um, some of the components of it, so the partners are, it's really spearheaded through our regional multi-state organization called NASCOM, which stands for the Northeast States for Coordinated Air Use Management. The Auto Alliance that represents all the auto, auto many of the auto manufacturers and global automakers. Um, there's an important community engagement component to it, as well as the use of both traditional and social media to get uh, messaging out there. So I talked a little bit about the partners. This just gives you a little bit more specifics in terms of the auto manufacturers that have been involved. And um, states have funded, uh, provided some funding, as has um, NYSERDA, as well as the auto manufacturers. So it's a really interesting collaboration uh, of, uh, you know, partners to come together to really focus on um, how education can help with vehicle deployment. Um, so, uh, okay, I'm sorry, I'm just kind of going through these. Uh, 
there we go. <laughs> My, my mouse is so sensitive, I apologize for that. So um, there have been uh, several components to the campaign. I uh, Just touching on a so social media has been one uh, critical tool, as well as community engagement. Really, and this is, uh, it was obviously the focus before COVID, uh, really engaging at the community level, small businesses, and really talking about, um, destinations you know this this gets into the the lifestyle component thinking about you know where you could drive um, your electric vehicle and how to really um, from a lifestyle perspective here are all the places you can go so that's been sort of an interesting angle on how to look at and uh, increase both increase awareness about electric vehicles but also to break down some of the barriers and misconceptions about the lack of charging so it really would um, as part of this element of the campaign really center on you know where there is charging available and make sure consumers were aware that they could go to all these great places one of our locations that we focused on was new haven just to identify all the great places you can go with your electric vehicle and charging is available so that's been the destination electric component of uh, the education and outreach piece of this regional campaign um, Recent, a recent focus has been looking at um, and identifying um, green city guides. So this just gives you a snapshot of um, the again, you know, focusing on destinations and things you can do, um, and to illustrate that there are great places for EV drivers uh, to visit. And um, and this was also a way to say, uh, you know, COVID has sort of disrupted what we've been doing. But now uh, we're also resuming programming and and focusing, you know, on these opportunities. And I've provided uh, in this slide the link where you can uh, look at all the content that's been developed as part of this campaign. So I think it's a really important component to get the word out there about um, electric vehicles and, and providing information to dispel some of those myths. The other um, tool I want to touch on, and then I'm going to leave it uh, for Tony to go uh, to provide more context as a board member, is uh, about our, um, our CHEAPER program, which stands for the Connecticut Hydrogen and Electric Automobile Purchase Rebate Program. Um, it was launched in 2015, and we have been providing rebates to customers um, at, at this point, it's it's over $11 million that's been deployed and it's uh, uh, over 6,000 vehicles that have um, uh, that been deployed as a result of customers taking advantage of these incentives. Um, I, you know, I we've worked really closely with the Connecticut Automobile Retailers Association and it was uh, the first incentive program in the in the country uh to uh you know provide sort of uh we like to talk about it as an incentive on on the hood of the vehicle um so really a customer friendly um mechanism to deploy incentives and i just want to highlight you know uh and josh will talk a little bit more but the program it really relies on our dealers and a, and a very close partnership with our dealers uh to make this work to make sure um that it really is customer friendly and when a customer uh, is in search of a vehicle they're getting you know the the best information about their options uh, when they're visiting the lot to buy a vehicle so that's been a really important component um, so the other thing just to mention anything about our cheaper program we have a lot of information on our website so i wanted to make sure i provided uh, a link to that and it just uh, it gives you all the all the details um, in terms of the vehicles that are eligible, a lot of um, information and interactive uh, statistics that are updated at a regular, uh, on a regular basis, and um, any additional uh, documents or uh, programmatic history is, is all, we uh, keep that all um, on our website. And I think that's, that's my last slide. <laughs> so I'll turn it back to you, Daphne.
Uh, we can't hear you, Daphne. You're on mute still. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Tony. Um, I was just saying, um, thank you so much, Tracy. And um, every time I hear you speak about this topic, I always learn something new. And you're always doing something, you're always doing something new to educate people and to, and to make the air quality better in Connecticut. And it's just um, exceptional, the leadership you and your team have taken. And um, thank you so much for all you're doing with education and outreach. It's incredible. And um, it's an amazing presentation. And I think it is a perfect seg segue over to Tony. So thank you, Tony, so much for joining us and to um, taking, this, taking this one step further into um, how, how do we pay for these? How do people? Yeah, good, good question. Um, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak on this today. My name is Anthony Chirolis. I am the Transport Hartford Coordinator from uh, at the Center for Latino Progress. Um, I'm also a board member. Uh, and there was a, a board created this year uh, to support the Connecticut Cheaper EV Rebate Program. Uh, I'm a member of that board in a very interesting situation. I haven't owned a car personally since the year 2010. Uh, occasionally I rent one. Uh, I try to rent uh, uh, when available hybrids. I have not yet had an opportunity to uh, get a battery electric rental uh, when I do take trips uh, uh, for vacation uh, and to visit family. Um, but uh, in that role on the CT Cheaper Board, um, I didn't have a lot prepared today to talk about the, the cheaper program itself, uh, but I can give a, a very rough overview uh, before making some comments. Uh, the uh, cheaper program is funded by a uh, fee, a greenhouse gas uh, emissions reduction fee, $5 fee that's levied on new and uh, re-registered vehicles in the state of Connecticut. Um, that was a legislative action in the, in 2019 that also created this Connecticut Cheaper Board, uh, of which I am a member. Uh, and along with another group of members, there is an upcoming meeting uh, in early October. Uh, and I'll put a link in the, in the chat for folks that would be interested in, in uh, uh, learning more about uh, what's being presented uh, and join in for that public meeting. Uh, so that uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction fee uh, was projected to bring in around $8 million per year. Uh, the legislation only trimmed off $3 million of that $8 million a year for the uh, Connecticut Cheaper EV Rebate Program. Uh, but it did provide a steady stream of funding for the uh, EV uh, incentives and rebates or zero emission vehicles and rebates. Uh, in reality, we that also includes um, hydrogen electric vehicles, even though there are none for sale in the state of Connecticut at this point, um, the, uh, at the consumer level. Uh, the $3 million a year is uh, administered by uh, DEEP uh, with input from the cheaper board uh, and uh, focused on uh, the EV rebate program and continuance of that EV rebate program through 2025. Um, the cheaper board is currently considering uh, a modification to that program to add low to moderate income uh, incentive bonuses. So uh, a individual making under $50,000 or a household uh, under $75,000 would have an additional EV rebate level, uh, uh, significantly uh, increasing the EV rebate for uh, moderate income households. In, in reality, uh, it would still be very difficult for a low income household or individual to purchase an, an EV. Um, the uh, board is also considering a proposal to uh, include used EVs and a rebate for used EVs uh, that is specific to low to moderate income households. Uh, so we're, we're excited about the increased accessibility uh, of electric mobility um, that that would bring. Uh, the other uh, items that have been recently discussed by the Connecticut Cheaper Board has been uh, looking at not just uh, electric cars uh, for uh, our state's uh, approach to reducing greenhouse gas emissions from uh, personal transportation. Um, the uh, as Tracy 
post, uh, it showed that the, the greenhouse gas emissions from the state's transportation sector is the, is the largest uh, contributor in the state. It's 38% uh, of the state's greenhouse gas emissions are from the transportation sector. Um, and we need to be creative in how we address that. Um, earlier this year, uh, there was a proposal uh, by Transport Hartford Academy and several of the board members to consider uh, non-car uh, EV or zero emission vehicle mobility uh, in this incentive program, specifically e-bikes, uh, which has been, um, e-bike e uh, incentives have been considered in other, in, considered and implemented in other states, uh, including the California example, uh, which includes uh, not just incentives in their cash for clunker program, not just incentives for shifting from a uh, inefficient uh, vehicle, gas powered vehicle, fossil fuel vehicle to uh, an electric car, uh, but it does include alternative incentives for transit passes, uh, e-motorcycles and e-bikes. Um, so looking at that full um, range of uh, zero emission or very low emission vehicle options uh, one thing I did want to mention uh, that became very evident to me as a board member uh, with Cheaper uh, was the significant disconnect between the available funding for EV rebates and the uh, goal. Uh, our goal of 125,000 electric vehicles uh, by 2025, um, based on the analysis by uh, the Center for Sustainable Energy, uh, CSE, who's uh, administering the program for deep uh, the gap uh, uh, in funding is significant. Uh, so over the next five years, five years, $3 million, $15 million over five years from that greenhouse gas emission reduction fee, we have $15 million. CSC projected that we needed 87 to $109 million uh, to reach that $125,000 or 125,000 EV vehicle goal uh, by year 2025. So uh, at this point, Connecticut cheaper and our EV incentive program is, is significantly underfunded. Um, from a, a funding perspective, you know, one of the challenges was that the, the legislature slurped most of the uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction fee into the general fund. Uh, so as uh, an interested party, you have the opportunity to tell your legislators that, that that's terrible uh, and that uh, most of a fee should go towards the dedicated purpose and, and not into a a kind of opaque general fund, especially when it comes to our climate emergency. Um, the other opportunities, um, we've been working on the transportation sector for the um, tra transportation sector report for the Governor's Council on Climate Change um, and revenue uh, and uh, a transition to a uh, sustainable transportation system has, has been a, a significant topic, of course, because that's the purpose of the report. Um, in that report, a couple of the revenue uh, generating uh, proposals has been a uh, gas guzzler uh, fee applied to uh, SUVs and non-commercial pickup trucks that are uh, inefficient, uh, low uh, miles per gallon. The federal, green, uh, the federal gas guzzler fee uh, did not include SUVs or pickup trucks uh, as those weren't a significant percentage of uh, passenger travel back when that program was created in 1978. And that uh, gas guzzler fee is between $1,000 to $7,000 per vehicle uh, for those uh, most inefficient uh, uh, vehicles in those classes. Uh, so that could be a dedicated uh, revenue stream for closing the gap for cheaper. Um, the other item that is uh, in the pipeline uh, for the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic states is the Transportation and Climate Initiative, which is a uh, cap and invest system where that cap is set if legislation passes in 2021 on sales of gasoline and diesel in uh, the participating states uh, in the region. Uh, and that cap goes down each year. And our fuel wholesalers for gasoline and diesel have to purchase credits in order to uh, sell uh, those fossil fuels within our state up to the cap. And that revenue from the auction sales uh, would be specifically invested in uh, greenhouse gas emission uh, reducing projects and infrastructure, uh, which could include uh, if Connecticut decides it's a priority. And I think with the track record of cheaper and 
EV rebates, um, it's very likely to include uh, uh, a boost to that budget to help close that gap for electric vehicle rebates. Um, so uh, those, those are the two uh, kind of revenue streams that we've uh, included as a possibility in the uh, Governor's Council for Climate Change report. Uh, and uh, of interest, uh, before I hand off, is um, both the uh, Governor's Council for Climate Change, the Connecticut report in our transportation section, section uh, and the Transportation and Climate Initiative uh, have a public comment session that's open right now uh, for the next several weeks. Uh, you, uh, I'll put some links in chat for uh, commenting on the Governor's Climate Council, and I'll point at where the transportation section is. Um, and it includes uh, electric vehicle uh, items, uh, as, it, as well as those revenue items that I mentioned. Uh, the Transportation and Climate Initiative uh, similarly has a public comment uh, that will be open for the next several weeks. Uh, they actually have a equity and environmental justice meeting uh, tomorrow on the Transportation and Climate Initiative. Um, and we'll be taking comments on the program design and uh, equity and, and environmental justice issues uh, for several weeks after that. Um, so opportunities to learn a little bit more and also uh, have your voice uh, heard. Um, and uh, our next meeting for the CT Cheaper Board is coming up in early October. And as a board member, um, I'm waiting to hear more. I think one of the things I'm very interested in in the next meeting is to uh, vote on what our 2021 uh, Connecticut Cheaper uh, incentive uh, structure is, um, as well as a, a potential uh, stimulus uh, in the either the first half or all of 2021, uh, which spends the uh, Connecticut Cheaper funds that did not get spent this year due to an economic downturn. Uh, not as many electric vehicles being sold, and the $3 million is significantly underspent. Um, and I think it, it's important that we put that to use. So that's what I've got. I'll hand off to the next person and catch questions at the end. I'll put some links in chat while uh, the next person's getting started. Awesome. Tony, thank you so much. Uh, always a pleasure to, to um, have you join us and um, your great uh, wealth of information. So thank you very much. Um, so we've had a, a great great session so far. We, we've talked about um, why we need EVs, why they're so important, what's the status of, of the cheaper program, and, and much more that Tony talked about. And then um, now we're gonna wrap up with, um, with Josh over there. I can see you're on the, on the floor there, the dealership floor of Maritime Chevy in Fairfield, Connecticut. So Josh, how are dealerships supporting EV sales. I know we talked this morning a little bit about how Fairfield has a, has a goal. Our goal in Fairfield is 2,175 EVs to sell by 2025. How are we going to do it? Well, we're, we're doing our part here at uh, Maritime Chevrolet. We have uh, 30 2020 bolts en route. We expect 15 in uh, October and 15 in November. So we're doing everything we can to uh, get them out there. And I'm gonna say about 70% of them qualify for the cheaper rebate. So we're, we're doing everything we can. And to be quite honest, I just took delivery of a Bolt uh, about a week and a half ago. And my wife and I and my 16 year old daughter love the vehicle. That's terrific. And, and we would, I, I would say we would like to thank Connecticut and the cheaper um, it, it helps. It really helps a lot. It's a it's a, a, a great program. So how do you um, how are how are the how are the sales staff there trained on how to sell electric vehicles? Is that something? Yeah, all of our sales staff here are fully trained on the vehicle. They've all driven it, taken it home overnight. They can uh, tell the customers everything you need to know. And I'm going to say probably the greatest, the greatest way to get somebody interested in a bolt is to get them behind the wheel. Uh, my wife was probably not um, too thrilled about it until now she won't stop driving it. it it's fun. It's, it's powerful. And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a hoot to drive. It's a great vehicle. We love it. And it, it was going to be my 16-year-old's vehicle. 
Um, how many, how, do you know how many electric vehicles your dealership has sold over the years? I don't, but I, I'm going to say up until this point, when, um, you know, probably approximately, including the Volt, which, which we uh, loved as well, but has been discontinued, we, we, we sold about between uh, 30 and 50 a year. Okay. And uh, when, when people come to, to the dealership looking for a car, um, how often are they looking for EVs? Are they just say, oh, well, I, I, they come, or how does that work? Well, if they're not looking for it, we certainly all here point it out, depending on what they're looking. If they come looking for a Suburban, you know, you're not going to point out a, an EV. But most other vehicles, when somebody comes, we want to point it out because everybody here loves the vehicle. So uh, if, they, if they have not come in looking for an EV, we certainly mention it and would love to get anybody behind the wheel because that's, that's what makes the vehicle. To get behind the wheel of a Chevy Bolt, you will love it. So um, I've, I've heard stories at, you know, at some dealerships, they don't, the, you know, they might have an EV on the lot somewhere in the back, but it's not always charged. But it sounds like you've got a no. charging station, you're ready to go, you're like, here it is, get behind, here are the yep. keys for a ride. Yeah, we, we actually have, we have two charging stations, a regular 240 and a, a fast charger. And, uh, you know, our customers certainly come and use them sometimes as well, but all of our electric vehicles are out front ready to go because we're we're fully committed to to the electric vehicle market and uh fully committed to helping Connecticut use that cheaper money up and and, and what is it that makes your dealership so so special and such a leader in this area as far as EVs you know it sounds like you really are doing everything well, right we, we, we want to be a leader in the EV market. We want to help you and help Fairfield get to 2,175 electric vehicles in a little over four years. And I think certainly Maritime Chevrolet will do our part if we can sell, uh, you know, a, approximately 100 new bolts a year going forward. And, and we have some new electric vehicles coming out as well. And we're supposed to be getting a small SUV based upon the bolt. So we're we're ready to go. We have factory trained technicians who know how to work on the vehicle here and, and all those things make a big difference. Yeah, they do. So with the, with the training of your sales staff, who, 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 who took that on? Did, all, did the salespeople just do training? Did you have workshops? Like how did you get every, there's, you know, there's a lot to know about, about an EV and to get everybody comfortable. There is. She Go ahead. Chevrolet provides a lot of training and they send a uh, special trainer who's uh, just for the Bolt. Uh, however, every, again, all of our sales staff has taken the vehicle home. They, they know how to operate all the different systems, and uh, that's how they got trained. Yeah. Well, I, I know that Maritime Chevy has been a big supporter of Fairfield's Earth Day celebration since the beginning, back in, you know, I think it was 2004. Um, so I know Maritime Chevy has always been a big supporter of Fairfield Earth Day, and um, we're so delighted to have you join us for the, the Green Wheels Expo. Do you think that, um, and you participated um, in the parade yesterday, right? At the, yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, Mike, Mike, our, our number one salesman, had a great time. He said it, he said it was great, met many people. And uh, we're again, we're we're happy and proud to be a supporter of this vehicle and of this technology. Do you, do do, it, do most of the people that come in looking for an EV do they have any idea about these about like the MOU, the goals and things like that, or they just want to get an EV? No, no. I'm going to say most people um, are just interested in in the electric vehicle, the te technology. We've been we have been promoting. Uh, unfortunately, due to COVID, we've been promoting what a great way to live off the grid, if you will. You really don't have to go to, a, you know, obviously, a gas station or anywhere else. Charge it at home, and, and uh, you can really stay safe. That's awesome. So you've got these vehicles coming. You've got two huge shipments. Um, what are your plans for, for um, letting everybody know about that? We're, we're going to have a huge, a huge unveiling. We're going to... Uh, do the electric slide. We're going to make a, uh, we do a lot of things on Facebook. So we're, we're going to highly, highly promote the vehicle with some terrific deals. The, the leasing, obviously, I'm going to say most people lease a Bolt and the leases are um, General Motors is hugely supporting the Bolt 
and with if, with the cheaper rebate that that helps as well and uh you can really lease a Chevy Bolt for less than $200 a month which is incredible less than most people's cell phone or cable bill yeah that's true um can you talk a little bit more about the about the charging infrastructure that it, that goes along with the car does it come with the car is it an extra how do how do you explain all of that to um to your potential customers? sure the uh che Chevrolet provides you with a uh oh no, I can't think of the name of the uh the the app and uh, it, it's most most charging is free at least for the first two hours. It comes with a, a 110 plug for your house, and that's what we use at my house. It, it, about four miles per hour is how much charge you get. However, most people don't drive more than 30 or 40 miles a day anyway. So if if you uh, plug it in at home, and you get uh, 40 or 50 miles each night, that that's more more than enough for most folks. Most people do not drive more than 30 or 40 miles a day. And there's, uh, like you said, Fairfield has, uh, I believe, 22 charge points, which is the most of any city in Connecticut. Is that correct? Yes. And our app that comes with the car, Charge Point, comes with a, uh, you know, a free charge point, And it, that will tell you, this is the, uh, the app, Charge Point, and it tells you where there's open charges, and, and uh, most of them are free. That's awesome. Um, so what do you think about what, what happened last week in California? And um, yeah. I, I think that's great. Uh, hope, hopefully, and I, not hopefully, I know Chevrolet will be a big part of it. You know, we, uh, General Motors is really committed to, to uh, being part of the electric vehicles. Cadillac, we, we also own Cadillac of Greenwich, and they're coming out with a couple new electric vehicles as well. That's terrific. So, um, so you would be behind a, a Connecticut, um, or maybe maybe we pass a resolution in Fairfield, right? Maybe we could do that. Sure. We got. Let's start small. Okay. Let's 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 do it. We'll put it on. We'll put it on the task list. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, it's just thank you so much. It's um, it's just amazing. Th th yeah. Go ahead. Thank you, Maritime Chevrolet. Would like to thank you for letting us be part of this, and we look for. Our, you will look for our continued support in the future. Wonderful. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much. It's great to talk with you. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. All right. So, um, so I just want to thank all of our, um, our amazing guests. We've, we've gone from the high level of, you know, um, why do we need to do this? And then um, talking about our incentive program. And now we've got this amazing a dealer here that is um, supporting supporting the sales, and I'm just wondering if um, if um, Tracy or um, Tony, if you have if you have any comments about about what's going on, what, what California did last week, and and how how you um, you know do you think Connecticut will follow suit on that or? Uh, good question. Um, uh, uh, the uh, call to uh, make uh, fossil fuel cars illegal by year 2035 is pretty, pretty radical. Uh, and and a, 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 what I would consider uh, an appropriate uh, level of urgency considering uh, the, the depths of our climate emergency and potential climate catastrophe within the next 20 years. Um, I know that we're in a climate emergency when I see companies like BP America and Ford uh, joining forces in the uh, Coalition for a Better Business Environment to support the Transportation and Climate Initiative. I'm not somebody who often takes phone calls from BP America. Um, <laughs> so, so seeing that sort of uh, corporate level uh, alarm and, and action, uh, action that is ahead of uh, what our states are doing and pushing our states uh, and region to do better uh, uh, helps drive home how uh, significant the changes we need to be making to our transportation system. Um, so that I'll, I'll put a link in there. The, it, it, uh, I, I had heard the BP and, and Ford announcement was coming, but uh, I, I didn't believe it until I saw it. So, so Tracy, do you have any any thoughts? 
Yeah, oh, no, I think it was an amazingly bold announcement. And, you know, we are we are very focused on everything California is doing uh, because of us opting into the California program. You know, as California progresses, we need to evaluate every step of the way. Um, so, you know, their next steps, we know coming out of the announcement from last week, we expect them to be right out of the gate holding stakeholder meetings. We're going to be engaged in that. They will, uh, I think they're very aggressively planning to move forward with rulemaking um, first quarter of next year. So it's a very aggressive schedule, but we will be evaluating, you know, uh, what they put forward, um, how they do it. Uh, just because uh, we have a statutory provision that get, gave us the authority to adopt California and there is a requirement to um, We need to update as we move along. So it will be, you know, something we, we you know, evaluate and uh, You know, look at what the next steps for Connecticut uh, might include and, you know, just to add it's it's all the it's all the states that signed on to the MOU um, and it's not just East Coast states. It's, a, you know, the alliance includes um, several states on the West Coast. So there'll be more to come. We'll be, you know, it'll definitely be something that's sort of front and center for Connecticut to consider as well. Yeah, I, I, awesome. going back to California, they've been doing some really uh, innovative stuff for years. Uh, 2014, uh, California passed a state law uh, working to uh, include uh, in their uh, environmental impact studies uh, the reduction of vehicle miles traveled, uh, so VMT. Uh, and I think that from a, uh, that was legislatively 2014 and then became, uh, you know, went into effect 2017. Uh, and uh, that's something that Connecticut hasn't done. Uh, we've, uh, it, as of 2018, the state uh, was still targeting um, a vehicle miles traveled increase of 13.9, uh, well, sorry, vehicle, tra vehicle miles traveled increase uh, for at least the Metro Hartford region of 13.9%. So we are, we are planning to drive more uh, and facilitate more driving over the next uh, 10 to 12 years. Um, and and with, even with our EV uh, adoption rate, um, planning for more vehicle miles driven is, you know, we don't have that percentage of EVs, and those EVs themselves have a, a life cycle greenhouse gas emissions uh, footprint. So, uh, you know, I'd love to see us go even further uh, and adopt their land use planning uh, and um, vehicle miles traveled reduction goals uh, at DEEP and DOT. Um, and when we, you know, look at state funding for transportation projects, this year we we're still funding expansions to I-84 and I-95 um, for real. We're adding lanes to highways right now. Um, and, and that is uh, exactly the opposite of an approach that a uh, state would have if we were trying to meet greenhouse gas emission reduction goals from the transportation sector. Well, thank you. Know, thank you. I just wanna thank you all, um, Tracy, Tony, and, um, and Josh. It looks like Josh has taken an order for, for another EV. He's right, mm -hmm. taking an order, Josh? Yes. <laughs> Yay. Um, so I just want to thank you all so much for helping us kick off the Sustainable Fairfields Green Wheels webinar series. Again, um, our series starts today. It goes all week long, every day at one o'clock. Tomorrow, please join us for a virtual site visit of Bridgeport's Proterra electric transit buses. How exciting is that? We're gonna have a virtual site visit of those beautiful electric transit buses. Please join us for that. On Wednesday, we're gonna learn how businesses can transition their fleets to electric. On Thursday, um, we'll be talking about municipal fleets and the part they play, how they can write RFPs to start moving their fleets towards electric. And Friday, our finale, we have our virtual site visit of White Plains Lion Electric School Bus. So it's a big week. We started off big and we're gonna just keep going. So thank you all so much for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you for the rest of the week and on the road in EVs all across the state. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.